over the years, I've actually pared down my um, talk about resumes and CVs. For starters, many people in academia have really good resumes and CVs already. I mean, you wouldn't be here if you didn't. But I still find that there's some, I would say, misconceptions about what a resume is and how it's used. So I'm going to just kind of give you guys a little true and false here. True or false, the purpose of a resume is to get you a job. True or false. A resume is the description of all your past achievements and work history. True or false. An individual resume can be sent out to many different employers without alteration. True or false. CVs and resumes, they're basically interchangeable. True or false. Now for the answers. The purpose of a resume is to get you an interview, not a job. And let me explain, because you know, on the hiring end, I will tell you what we use resumes for. When we do a job advertisement, we put in everything we could possibly want. And yes, these job advertisements, when we have a position opening, we've got a lot of things we'd love to have. But you send us your resume and your cover letter, and we take the resume and try to figure out if you have at least the minimum amount of material to be a viable candidate. Okay? So that's the first step of the resume. If you have, then we get put into a pile where you're there for further consideration. Once we've dismissed the people who have absolutely no background or experience for this job, and believe it or not, I mean, I would say that we average three quarters of the resumes we receive for a job are from people who are totally unqualified, who seem to think that, like, they can just send us a resume and maybe we'll, I don't know, change our mind. So if you're in that pile, of people who are at least reasonably well qualified. Here's what happens next. In our company, we take each of your resumes, we come up with an Excel spreadsheet where we've characterized key skills and key experience, and then we grade you, give you a numerical score across all those different columns. And then we look at this maybe list of 10 or 15 resumes, and we see which are the top five or six people. Maybe there's some that have little curious elements we want to have a phone interview for, in which case we'll call you and we will ask you some questions, have a chat for 15 or 30 minutes. Then we rank the candidates and decide which three to five we want to actually go for an interview. At that point, the resume is done. The resume has done its job. From that point all onward, the only thing the resume is used for is essentially I take notes on it. I take notes about the conversations we have. I take notes about some of the details you gave me about your background, and that's all it is. A resume needs to get you an interview, which means it needs to provide detailed and specific information that's relevant enough that causes me to want to speak to you more. A resume is not going to get you a job on, all by itself. And as I said, a resume is a description of those past experiences that are most relevant to the position being sought. One hiring manager told me that a resume is as much about where you are going as where you have been. And I know that sounds a little cryptic, but what it means is that you should be able to with your networking and informational interviewing, understand about the position, understand what's required, background, skills. One really great thing to, to look out for during informational interviews is keywords and standard industry language. And make sure that if you have a background and experience, maybe you haven't used the same terminology as is used in this industry, but you can use that terminology by applying what you've done using this, these words that are familiar with the industry. And as I said, you should adapt your resume for each specific job open. This is why I say never, never, never post a generic resume, because a generic resume is going to be generic. It's not going to be specific to any one job opportunity. You should read the job description carefully. You should talk to your network. You should listen to all that advice and use words from the job description or from the industry as much as possible. If, you have a, if there's a job opening for MRI technologist and you do nu NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, call it MRI. Use the right terms. Don't make me, as you know, hiring manager in this early screening process, you know, figure out how you're mapping your experience onto my job. Make sure that you do the mapping for me. Finally, resumes and CVs are um, totally different documents. Um, they shouldn't be used interchangeably, but there are some environments where people may want to know a little bit about your publication list. I will say one funny thing is a lot of people tend to list their PhD advisor on a resume. In the outside world, you know, we don't know who these people are. It's not relevant to us. It is relevant where your education is, but rather than having that be at the top of your resume, it's one of the things we think is probably best put at the bottom of the resume.
Your experience is what matters most. The best resumes clearly connect with the job being advertised, and they highlight key accomplishments that are relevant to the position being sought. They tell specific stories, not just, you know, was responsible for blah, 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 but tell me key accomplishments, you know, um, achieved 67% reduction in errors across blah, 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 or raised $73,000 from a variety of sources. Those are very specific, action-rich past tense verbs. Now, cover letters are also a real critical part, especially for technology people, because, as I said, they, the people in the outside world have such, um, <laughs> I don't know, um, low expectations for us as communicators that writing a really good and compelling cover letter really can set you apart. So I recommend that your best cover letters are engaging, direct, and well-written, and that they actually challenge the reader to rethink their preconceived notions of you. You know, I had somebody to, um, show me one of their cover letters. It was a great cover letter. They were applying for a job um, actually at the Nature Conservancy, and they were a PhD in, I think, um, botany. And the cover letter said, I know you see PhD on my resume and you think I'm applying. Yeah, I've made a mistake and applied for the wrong job. But let me tell you why I'm so excited by this opportunity to work at the Nature Conservancy. And thus began her letter, which was interesting and engaging, and it was one of the things that the employer talked about when they actually made her the offer. Now, some of you may have gaps or, you know, quote unquote mismatches or, or places where you don't have experience. That's where your cover letter can try to make, the, make the, the difference, where you say, I know I don't have three years industry experience, but I've been working in an analytical lab at a university for five years, and we encounter many of the same challenges, such as blah, blah, blah. And now you can see why informational interviewing can be so valuable because you can learn what the industry finds important and then you can map that knowledge and, and those terms to what you've actually done in um, your school.